He's the only date I ever went on where I was scared, so I never forgot it. A former escort says she went on a date with the man accused of being the Gilgo Beach serial killer and lived to tell the tale. Now, Nikki Brass is here to tell her story and why she believes she made it home that night. Our podcast, I'm Anjanette Levy. The Long Island serial killer case shows exactly how dangerous it can be to work as an escort. Nikki Brass worked as an escort several years ago, and in the time she worked as an escort, she said there was only one date that scared her. She says that date was with Rex Hjorman, the man accused of murdering three women who worked as escorts. Hjorman remains behind bars in the Suffolk County Jail where he's being held without bond. He's accused of murdering three petite escorts, Melissa Bartholomew, Amber Costello, and Megan Waterman. The district attorney says Hurman is the prime suspect in the murder of Maureen Brainerd Barnes. Hurman has said through his attorney that he is innocent, but the DA says DNA and cell phone records connects him to the victims and the crimes. Joining me to discuss Rex Hurman is someone who actually went on a date with him. She is Nikki Brass. She is a hairstylist and a makeup artist and a former escort. Nikki, welcome to Sidebar. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Nikki, when did you first realize that Rex Hjorman was somebody that you had encountered some time ago? So uh, he's the only date I ever went on where I was scared, so I never forgot it. And for the last nine, ten years, I've told dozens of people that I swear I sat down and had dinner with the Gilgo Beach killer and people thought I was crazy. And, and once he was arrested, my friend recognized his picture because I showed it to her before the date and said, you know, he's an architect in Manhattan. And she remembered it and she was like, oh my God, it was him. And I just, I, I knew, I knew it was him. I knew it was him. Was this soon after he was arrested? Like right afterwards? Um, so he got arrested. I have, I have, you know, kids, so I, I watch more kid shows than I get to, to the news these days. But, uh, once the story broke, I had texted her and I said, Hey, you should go check out the news. The Gilgo Beach killer was arrested. Go look at him. And she went and turned it on. And right away she was like, Oh my God, it's him. How did you, how did this date get arranged? Was it on Backpage? Was it on Craigslist? Um, so, I mean, I had uh, Backpages, Seeking, Sugar Daddies. I had so many different pages with ads with a Google-generated number that you could contact me on. So I'm not sure which one he contacted me through. Um, I tried reaching out to one, uh, one of the sites and actually asking if they could pull the messages between us on, on that now deleted account, you know, and they uh, wouldn't do it because I wasn't the owner of his account. So law enforcement, um, you know, just so the viewers and listeners know, they can subpoena that information, um, yeah. but you can't get that information. Yeah. Um, and not only that, um, because I was on so many sites with the generated number, there's no way for me to tell you with absolute certainty which one he contacted me through. So you think it was 10 or 11 years ago, you know, so that it was uh, summer uh, of 2015, summer of 2015. Yes. So when he reaches out to you, he calls you on the number. It's a Google generated number, you said. He and then call. we texted. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so you guys texted over the Google-generated number. Uh, do you remember what he said, or was it just like, hey, I'd like to meet up with you? Initially, it was, hey, I'd like to meet up with you. Then it was, um, he wanted me to go directly to his house in Massapequa. And when I tell you I'm, like, the most locationally challenged person on Earth, I can live somewhere for five years, and I still need to GPS getting home. So mm. I I was very unfamiliar with Massapequa, and I said to him, you know, I'd, I don't want to go directly to your house. I don't know the area. I don't have friends there. I'd feel a lot more comfortable if we met in a public local place near me. 
And if I'm comfortable, like, she's sure, I'll come back to your place. But he wanted you to come to his home. He wanted me to come directly to his home. He didn't want to meet at a public restaurant. Knowing what you know now, because the police are saying the dates he would go on with the women that he's accused of murdering uh, happened when his wife was out of town. So does that freak you out, kind of thinking about that in hindsight? No, what freaks me out in hindsight is thinking that this man sat across from me bragging because he knew I was in such a vulnerable position in my life that I wouldn't go to the cops because, one, I probably wouldn't be believed, or two, I'd probably be arrested. But but I think that's what freaks me out the most is that he may have put hypotheticals or said, you know, he or what he thought, but it was somebody who had done it and been there describing those crimes, and I think that's what scared me the most. So tell me about the date. Uh, tell me exactly where you met in public and, and what happened from there, if you don't mind. Um, so we didn't meet at his car. I know a lot of people were like, did you see what kind of car he was driving? No. So he met me directly in front of the restaurant, uh, the steam room in Port Jeff. We walked in, we grabbed a seat, we ordered drinks. He was surprised that I don't drink alcohol. I don't know why that's such a surprising thing to people. Um... And he ordered his drink. We ordered some food. I don't remember what he got, but I know I got salmon and rice because I was allergic to shellfish. And we started talking. And everything seemed normal, very basic, like, you know, generic chatter that you would use, you know, when you're first meeting a person, first date. Uh, And then switched to, he asked if I was interested in true crime. And at that point, it still wasn't weird for me. I actually got excited because I am a true crime fanatic. Like, I could quote very weird, random things from serial killers or or no facts that very few people know. Like, very, very heavily involved in, you know, the true crime scene. But even though I'm a fan and I'm involved, I have empathy for the victims. The way he described things wasn't like the point of view of somebody who, you know, had empathy for the victims. So basically, like, when he talked about the other killers and their victims and different things like that, he talked about it like a true crime buff. He talked about it the way I would or you would or any other person would. Um, it was when we got to him saying, have you heard of the Gilgo Beach murders? And I said, yes, I've heard of the Gilgo Beach murders. And I was like, I'm from Long Island. We all have. And um, that's when he started talking about it. He sat up straighter. He had like this smirk on his face. It was almost like he was like excited to talk about it. Like, Ah, I get to talk about it now. This is great. What did he say about the Gilgo Beach murders? So uh, he asked me if I thought Shannon Gilbert, that Jersey City girl, was connected. I said, yeah. And he said, yeah, I do too. Uh, And then another thing he said was, how do you think they get rid of the bodies without going notice? And I said, I don't know. I've never been to the area ever. I don't know the access points. I don't know anything about it. And he said, well, it's very dark and desolate. And then he goes, you know, what if they treaded through the marsh? And I don't know if he meant in one of those big rubber suits walking through it with camouflage bags or if he meant he took a small boat with no light or what he meant by that. But that was one hypothetical. And the other he gave was, Well, a cop could easily do it without anyone bothering him. Turn his lights on, park, put a cone up. No one's going to bother him. So what happens after that part of the discussion? Did you think 
this is just a little too creepy. It's a little too descriptive. I'm, I'm out of here or what happened? Um, so I tried to be polite. I actually stayed through the whole thing. And I remember him saying, it's up to 10 victims now, right? Um, and I said, I think so. I wish I could describe it. Like, I wish there was a word for it. But he seemed like somebody who was reliving it and enjoying it, like almost like almost like mentally orgasmic. Like, like later on, he was going to get to reveal the truth to me that all along it was him. Like he was building up to it at the dinner, and almost like it was a game for him. It was funny. Like the way he talked about the victims was like, well, they were just escorts. They were just prostitutes. They were just whores. And then he'd be like. But don't worry, I don't think of you that way. I know you have aspirations and hopes and dreams. And, you know, I feel like he did that to all the victims. But, like, how dare you, you know? Uh, my biggest reason for coming on is people are like, oh, she wants 15 minutes of fame or this or that. And it's not that. It's these women are being dehumanized for a job that they did. And I want people to realize that you can end up in a really vulnerable situation where you have no other options but that. And that that doesn't change that they had oh, hopes and dreams and aspirations. Like, like, I got the chance to become a mother. I got the chance to become a really talented hairstylist and makeup artist. I was given that chance because I survived. These women had that taken away from them because he thought that he had the right to do that. And that that's my biggest thing is I want people to put a face to these women that isn't just an escort. I want them to see that these women, if they had gotten a chance, probably would have gotten out and lived their dreams too. And, and I think that's very important. Um, I think that they are dehumanized. I agree with you um, by some people and, and ultimately um, by the person who took their lives. Um, did he say to you in your discussions how he believed the women were killed? I know he said strangulation and hammer. I know he said, I feel like a hammer would be real quick and easy. He said, usually it'll take one time. As if hitting them once with the hammer in the head would usually do the trick. And, I, you Did know, his si size and his weight, I could imagine that kind of force would be at one time would be enough. I said, you know, and I think also other sick things go on, like cutting fingers off or toes, just a lot, you know, torture in small ways. I feel like he's an animal who's been slowly building up and, you know, you don't just kill for 10 years and suddenly get caught. This man's been traveling for a very long time. He's smart. He's calculating. He's cunning. He knows what he's doing. There are a lot more women connected to Rex Bierman than just who he's charged with. And I think in the future, we're, we're going to see that. What what happened after all of this discussion? And you said you're polite. Uh, you stayed through the dinner. So he asked if I was going to come home with him. And at that point, I was really, I had uh, a bad feeling in my stomach. I was scared. I was thinking I might have to order that weird drink from the bartender to get me out of here. And I ended up saying to him, you know, it's late. I don't know Massapequa. I don't want to drive there and then have to drive home that late and that tired. Maybe another time. And he was like, no, no, no. Like, leave your car here. You would take my car. Why would we take two cars? That's stupid. Like, let's just save gas. Like, very insistive that I took my car and left it in the parking lot and went into his car. And in hindsight, I think it's because he didn't want to be on traffic cameras having to get rid of a girl's car. 
so how did things end? I mean, did he did he pay you at all, or did you just say, you know, I think I'm gonna go home? How did how did things wrap up? I didn't get paid. I said, you know, thank you for it was nice meeting you, but I don't think this is gonna work out. And I had texted a friend and had them meet me in the parking lot because I was scared. And I told Rex, you know, oh, I have somebody meeting here, meeting me here just to make sure I get home okay. Uh, because I feel like if he didn't know that information, he might have been planning to go after me in the parking lot for all I know. He was terrifying. So I got up. He, he gave me that firm handshake again. And we walked out, and my friend waved to me. And he, you could tell he was very visually agitated. He was annoyed he did all that work, and I wasn't going with him. Um, like, you, you could definitely see the agitation within him, but I was just glad to get out of there. When he introduced himself to you, how did he introduce himself? Um, online, you, we you... had fake, fake names. I couldn't even <laughs> tell you what at this point. Uh, but when we met, I said, hi, my real name's Nikki. It's nice to meet you. Something along those lines. And he said, Rex. And that was it. But I knew he was an architect from Manhattan before I even went on the date with him. So you left. Never heard from him again, I assume? Or did you ever hear I, from him again? I deleted counts. I blocked numbers. I made it where it was impossible for him to find me again because... I did not want that encounter. My Everything in my body told me that I needed to get away from that man. But he originally I, wanted you to come to his home. Yeah. And and when I tell you, I've met men, you know, I've, I've, I never felt that for any other man ever. I never felt that kind of fear except for with him. And that's why I remember it so vividly is because I was so scared. I feel like you don't forget that kind of fear. When did you stop um perf when, when did you stop this line of work? Was it shortly after that? Did you think I have to really do something else or are you do you, so, do you remember? Um the system kind of had me screwed for a little while there. I had a few years uh, after where I couldn't I couldn't get out of I dance, I worked at strip clubs, things like that in nature, but I didn't do sex work as like as an escort anymore. Um, I kind of got scared out of it, but I was working strip clubs and still in the sex work industry. Um, it took eight, either eight to ten years of my felony being that old for me to be able to finally get accepted back into a school and start making a career and a life for myself. So, Nikki, have you contacted the Suffolk County Police Department? Have they interviewed you at all about this interaction you had with Rex? So it, they didn't, um, you know, reach out to me at all for a while. It took up until the last week to, to finally reach out to me. And I set up an appointment to go there, but I have a newborn and other kids, and I was so exhausted. I ended up passing out. And, you know, while my daughter napped, I, I ended up napping too, and I missed it. And I, I called, and we're going to reschedule it for probably late this week or next week to mm -hmm. go in and, and have an interview. But, I yeah, I ruined that. I slept right through it. I was exhausted. Was there, or, or do you have any final thoughts uh, about about this? I, I, you know, I can't imagine realizing I went to dinner uh, with somebody who is accused it's, of something so awful. I mean, that that had to just be really chilling. It's not a new realization. This is something I've been telling people for years. So for me, this isn't a new discovery. This is something I've known. Um. It's just, not, it, it's, it's the validation of knowing my instincts were right. That feels good. But otherwise, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I could have been another victim had I made a different choice. Well, I think that we're all glad that 
you you had such good instincts and you trusted your gut. They always say trust your gut, uh, and you did. Nikki, Nikki, uh, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it, and we hope you'll come back another time. I would love. I reached out to Suffolk County Police and asked whether detectives plan to interview Nikki Brass about her experience. A spokesperson told me the department does not comment on who detectives have or have not interviewed. However, the spokesperson said if Nikki Brass had an encounter with the suspect and wants to tell her story, she can contact the task force to schedule an interview. That's it for this edition of Law & Crime Sidebar Podcast. You can listen to and download Sidebar on Apple, Spotify, Google, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, you can always watch it on Law & Crime's YouTube channel. I'm Anjanette Levy, and we'll see you next time.